Sports broadcasters spend countless hours describing the heroic actions of athletes on the court or the field, and even more time trying to conjure up unique and original ways to define heroism. When truth is, as we've all seen watching the horrors of war on TV from halfway around the world, real heroics occur on real battlefields. So maybe we ought to rethink our language. But what about when hero really fits, even for a sports broadcaster? Jeremy Schapp explains. Eight seconds left. Working to the right side high. Anthony's got it. Drives to his right. Pulls up the wing. Jump shots away. Yes! Three seconds to go. Time out, Phoenix! As the radio voice of the Denver Nuggets for the last 14 years, Jerry Schemmel has flown across the country and around the world. But all those trips are far less significant to him than a single hour he spent aboard one plane in the summer of 1989, when he was 29. It's going to be a part of my life forever. I think about it all the time still. It still, it still hurts and it still haunts. At the time, the deputy commissioner of the Continental Basketball Association, Schemmel and his boss and close friend, CBA Commissioner Jay Ramsdell, were among the 296 people aboard United Flight 232 flying from Denver to Chicago. Cruising along 37,000 feet, no turbulence, nothing out of the ordinary at all, when we felt it and heard this explosion. And to give you some idea of what I, I felt and sounded and heard, what sounded like and that I heard was that I thought a bomb had gone off. One of the DC-10's three engines had exploded. The rudders and the brakes were rendered useless. Apprised of the direness of the situation, Schemmel and his fellow passengers spent an excruciating 45 minutes sorting out what many assumed would be their final thoughts. I had a great marriage to a woman that I really loved. I had a neat little career and I thought things, if I have to go, are pretty much in order and I think I feel pretty good about them. There were passengers that were writing notes and women that were putting their identifications in their bras and when I saw this one man and he was leading everyone they were all holding hands and he was leading the whole row in prayer and then other people were crying finally the pilot announced that he'd be attempting an emergency landing in Sioux City Iowa as the plane made its final approach Schemmel braced for impact we're coming in so fast at the end that there wasn't any way to avoid a slamming into a runway. He's coming down real fast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Immediately after we hit, total chaos in the cabin. With the first couple of seconds, bodies being thrown about, some still strapped in their chairs, others, others thrown from their chairs. Uh, debris and smoke and fire everywhere in the first couple seconds after we hit down. Dazed but remarkably unscathed, Schemmel climbed out of the wreck and into a cornfield where his section of the plane had finally come to rest. I took a couple of steps away and I heard a baby crying back inside the plane. And the next thing I know, I'm back inside the wreckage. I didn't think about it, I didn't weigh any risk. I didn't think if I go back in the thing, I might not find my way back out or it might explode. It just happened. I heard the crying and I, and I just jumped back in the wreckage. Amid flames and debris, Schemmel found and then carried to safety 11-month-old Sabrina Michelson. Sabrina had been flying with her parents and two brothers. Miraculously, all the Michelsons survived the crash. In fact, 184 passengers survived, but 112 were killed. Schemmel desperately tried to determine whether Jay Ramsdell, his friend and colleague, had lived or died. Jerry came up and he said, do you remember my friend? I said, yes, you know, they were the last two to get on the airplane and it was easy to remember them. And he said, I can't find my friend Jay. Can you help me find him? I couldn't find him anywhere in the, in the premises. I had to hold out hope and that I knew I'd be talking to his family and his friends and people from our office and I couldn't tell him that. I couldn't say, I think he's gone. But he was, at 25. Even as Schemmel was trying to come to terms with Ramsdell's death, he was hailed as a hero for rescuing Sabrina Michelson. But the accolades made him uncomfortable. I just believe God was 
intending her, for her to live. And I think if I wouldn't have grabbed her, someone else would. I know that sounds corny and that's downplaying what happened, but I really believe that. In the months following the crash, Schemmel experienced an acute case of survivor's guilt. His depression lifted, he says, only after he embraced his faith in God. I just said a simple prayer, I just asked God to come into my life and give me some kind of relief from this crash, some kind of reprieve. And when I said that, it worked. <laughs> Sabrina and Schemmel haven't seen each other since the crash, but every year she sends him a card and a picture. Well, the, um, the one card that I remember most is, um, <laughs> came at Christmas and she said, well, thank you for saving my life. And um, that one kind of stands out above the others, I guess. And um, I wrote her back and I said, I, di I didn't save your life, I just grabbed you. You, uh, you were already saved at that point. Sabrina Michelson and her family have never spoken publicly about the crash, but in 2001, at the age of 12, she posted a message on a Flight 232 internet message board, which in part read, I feel very lucky to have survived the crash and that my whole family survived. It makes me feel very lucky to think that if it wasn't for Jerry, I wouldn't be alive today. I would like to thank him for saving my life.